we're going to keep going. Uh, we have, of course, investors in the fintech scene also sharing their uh, opinion and views uh, now. I shared uh, some data, some present, a presentation on the state of European fintech funding and exits. Uh, this is something that we're going to discuss uh, with a very, very, very uh, diverse and cool panel of people. I uh, would like to welcome to the virtual stage, first of all, Adiza Teani from uh, HSBC Ventures. Uh, also Vinod uh, from Molten Ventures, previously known as Draper Esprit. Uh, we also have Suzanne Chisti from Fintech Circle. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Reginald de Wasage from Augmentum Fintech joining us. I see all four of them are already ready to go, which is amazing. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, maybe give us a little bit of an introduction. We have half an hour, but keep it uh, as brief as possible, uh, just to give us some context about who you are and uh, what you do as a company. Uh, Reginald, should we start with you? Yeah, happy to. Um, good morning, everyone. So Reggie here, I'm part of the investment team at Augmentum Fintech. We're a listed focus, uh, a fintech focused fund based in London, investing at Series A and Series B. Um, and where we write checks between five and 20 million pounds as a first equity ticket um, with a European mandate. I think what's defined us, and uh, Vinos might also touch upon that because we have a bit of a similar structure, is that we're listed. So we're not a typical GPLP fund, uh, which gives us a permanent capital base to support um, well entrepreneurs for the long run. Thank you, Reggie. Uh, Adiza, maybe you can take it away. I know you just very recently changed roles within HSBC, uh, but please give uh, us a brief introduction. Hi, I'm Adiza. Um, I cover our portfolio at HSBC Ventures. Um, we have a broad team, a global team based in San Francisco, uh, Hong Kong, London, uh, Bangalore as well. And we look at investing in companies that help our strategic goals and aims as a global bank and institution. Um, and we work with all of our different business lines um, and so our portfolio is pretty diverse, uh, covering work that we do in the retail sector versus work that we do with institutions and corporate clients as well. So our remit is pretty vast and um, we have a broad portfolio uh, covering things like ESG to um, cyber security tech, um, but we are pretty active in the London fintech space. Uh, my background, I joined the fintech space about a decade ago and have had multiple different roles. And I'm glad to be on this side of the table at the moment. Great, well, thanks again for, for joining us. Um, Suzanne, uh, I hope I didn't butcher your last name in the introduction, uh, but welcome as well. Yes, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Suzanne Chisti, I'm the CEO and founder of Fintech Circle. And we invest in fintech startups early stage, uh, which basically means it's a first round, you know, when startups look for external funding as angel investors. So we are a group of 70 angel investors here in London. And our focus is uh, really angel stage uh, startups so often before they become interesting, you know, for the VC space. Uh, we also source deals for early stage funds. So at the moment, we're just uh, looking for, and, and basically have chosen, you know, about 10 startups uh, for the so-called SERS round, which is the first 150K in the UK. So we will deploy 1.5 million by early April into the 10 best, you know, fintech startups in this area. So it's both, you know, individual investments by angel investors, but also working with early stage funds to source the best early stage companies. Great. Well, thanks also to you for joining. Last but not least, uh, we have Vinod from Malton. I know you had a very busy schedule, so thank you for making it for the panel. Thanks for having me. Uh, fantastic to be here. I'm Vinod. Uh, I'm a partner at uh, what was Draper Esprit and is now Malton Ventures. We are a public listed venture capital fund, typically investing at Series A, B, and C. Uh, check sizes of anywhere between five and 50, five zero. That was very brief and very good. Um, I'm not going to assume that you caught my presentation at the beginning of this event, um, but I did share some numbers uh, on the European fintech industry, which I'll repeat uh, for context uh, sake. Um, so we tracked about uh, 26 billion euros invested in European fintech, including UK, of course, um, which is about roughly a fourth of all investment going to European startups uh, for the full year. Uh, so it's quite extraordinary how heavily uh, the fintech sector sort of weighs on the, the overall investment that is going into, into European uh, innovation companies. And we've 
had lots of discussions uh, in the past already about uh, why Europe is so big on fintech. But I would love to hear sort of from, from an investment perspective uh, about, you know, sort of the reason that fintech is such a, a dominant sector in the, in the industry as a whole. Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Adiza. I, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Sorry, Robin, I couldn't hear the question. Uh, the question was, why do you think fintech is such a dominant sector in the overall uh, technology industry with one fourth of uh, investment going into fintech last year? Uh, I think it is the work that has been done over the last few years to make sure that the fintech sector is a sector of growth. So I think if you cast your mind back to um, to like before the pandemic and even um, 2013, 2014, um, there was a lot of work done to make sure that uh, stakeholders across the ecosystem, across Europe, actually thought that this was a sector that could drive growth and change and also had a huge market cap to tackle when it comes to um, investing in startups. I think that those of us that have been in the fintech space for a while have seen how that there's been evolution from uh, using technology to uh, tackle problems at the personal finance uh, level, then also it evolving when things like open banking or Web3 or crypto all have come up as well. So I think that um, the evolution didn't start um, now. So where we are now has actually uh, taken a long time uh, to get here. And I would say that fintech is a pretty strong sector globally because everybody um, understands that financial services is a core part of the economy and the need to change um, the way that we interact and, and use, utilize and technology to enable change is important. Um, and working with startups to do that is one of the best ways to do it. But I would also say that there's a talent aspect there as well. If you look at the number of uh, fintech founders that have come from the uh, financial services industry or that have um, cut their teeth within the financial services industry over the last few years, that also has helped with the encouragement that uh, you're putting your money in the right place um, and with people that know what they're doing um, overall. So I think it's a maturity of the sector over the last few years. Um, and I hope other verticals in tech, um, the startup space also sort of follow that path. Um, because everyone now says that they're a fintech, but once upon a time, that wasn't the case. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm not going to make the mistake of asking the same question one by one, uh, but I do want to get Vinod's take as well uh, on sort of the, the ongoing maturation of the fintech industry in Europe and what it means for, for investors. I think one of the interesting underpinning drivers of growth in the fintech industry has been uh, two things. One is that we do have forward-thinking regulators particularly that of the UK and, and also in Germany, uh, the BAFTA and the FCA have been entirely encouraging of innovation through the various ways in which they produce the licenses to support the companies. And the second is uh, the fact that the entrepreneurs based in Europe typically have, a, there are only very few markets where a single market approach is enough to be successful. For example, in Germany, for example, in the UK, but more, most of the plays across Europe have to be cross European and then global expansion either into APAC, APAC or the US. And so that fundamental mindset of having to be in more than, more than one country from the get-go is driving the way in which you need to think about localization across the whole of Europe. And I think that's different to how you scale in the US. And so that's been one of the great traits of the European FinTech uh, entrepreneurs. Great, so moving to, to Reggie, different question. Um, I mentioned we, we tracked about 750 FinTech funding deals last year alone. Uh, that's massive, there's lots of activity. Um, you're sort of a pure vertical uh, player in this uh, investment space. Uh, what do you get most excited about in terms of subsector? Because uh, FinTech, of course, spans a lot of you know, intra tech payments, uh, lending, um, crypto. Uh, what are you most excited about uh, in terms of innovation in the industry today? Yeah, I mean, you're right. We, we, we look at all sectors. So we are within FinTech, we are sector agnostics. We look at, you know, wealth tech, insure tech, rec tech. Uh, we look at all business models, you know, from B2B to B2C to B2B to C. So we're looking at all areas uh, within the fintech universe. 
But what I'm most excited about now um, is really embedded finance on one side, you know, embedded payments, embedded insurance, uh, embedded lending. So we see lots of areas where fintech companies really empower others uh, and other services to be provided, you know, in a very smooth, very um, frictionless manner. And those are the ways where, where scalability is, is a huge advantage as well and that can be achieved, you know, easier. So that's one area which we are very excited about. The second area is an area which we call green fintech or responsible fintech. Uh, and that's what is anything to do with ESG and finance. So, you know, green fintech really means looking at how can fintech play a role in our global ESG agenda? Or how can fintech, you know, play a role in helping refugees? I mean, it's a big topic nowadays, obviously. Uh, and there's an area of fintech which is called refugee tech. You know, so how can we help with mobile payment solutions, people who had to escape just with a suitcase, uh, to allow them access to financial services. So that's, uh, I think these are growth areas, you know, but FinTech for good. And uh, and I would say also financial inclusion globally, you know, there's so much more we can do by getting though, these 2 billion people who have got no bank accounts into financial services. And financial inclusion is not just a topic for emerging countries, but it's a topic for Western countries as well. Because even here in the UK, we've got 4% of people who have got no bank accounts. You know, in the US, we've got 40% of people who have got less than $400 in savings. So it's an enormous issue globally. And uh, so these are the things which we are very interested in. Yeah, so financial inclusion, FinTech for good, which is also something that came up in the previous discussion. Uh, super interesting. Uh, Reginald, do you have anything to add uh, from your perspective? Yeah, I would say that the pandemic really accelerated some digitalization trends and has been a catalyst for opportunities in FinTech. Uh, we have seen general growing fintech adoption, um, lasting behavioral changes in payment, future of work. So where we at Augmentum are pretty excited are probably five key themes. Uh, first one would be on asset management, where we significant, where we see significant AUM inflows um, and increasingly demanding investor base with young, younger generation um, getting more and more um, fin financial literate. The, the sub-themes that we look within that are embedded ESG, uh, and also the retailification of asset management. Um, a second uh, key theme would be the SME financial stack. So CFO as a service, accounting tech. Um, I think there's there, we, we have seen a lot of digitalization and digital transformation for SMEs, and uh, we're ex extremely excited about that specific vertical as well. Um, a third theme would be on future of work. So everything which relates to financial well-being, employee benefits, where we have really seen a shift in uh, the, the labor markets, um, also accelerated by the pandemic. Um, the fourth theme would be on digital assets. I think um, every, every fintech investor is no, now looking at that trend. Um, we at Augmentum are very much focused on the infrastructure layer of digital assets, thinking about fraud detection, the trading infrastructure, um, and those types of, uh, of sub-verticals. And then the fifth one would be on, on insure tech. So beside traditional financial services, it's also part of our, our strategy. Um, and we're extremely excited about B2B workflow facilitation, dynamic underwriting, and those type of sub, uh, sub themes. Great. Well, one sub vertical that I didn't uh, think was mentioned, I don't think was mentioned, but I think personally is quite interesting is the whole security aspect, you know, uh, fraud detection and prevention, uh, preventive cyber yeah. attacks, uh, which I think is also quite a, quite a growing sector. Uh, Adiza, do you have any thoughts on that from sort of the HB, HSBC perspective? Yeah, I think that it's it's super important to make sure that you invest in companies that will help. We we call it um, operation efficiency when it comes to that sort of stuff, um, as well as looking at uh, security. Um, we've got uh, companies like um, uh, Menlo Security, Contexa, who use technology and help us use technology to do that. And I think the difference with us is that the technologies that we invest in, we also use um, and to help protect our customers. Um, and I would say players like Biocatch are also helping us um, in that kind of security um, area as well. And I think some people call it boring fintech, but those the boring fintech is also, I think, um, the fintech that is evergreen and everlasting because 
Um, it's so important to make sure that you are investing in infrastructure to protect your customers um, and to look at um, areas that will, will basically future-proof you as much as possible um, and also upgrade what you're doing. So companies that I think are doing great things, there are companies like Biocatch, CallSign, um, Contexa, all as a package helping um, in those areas. I think that you can't, you have to make sure that you have a strategic approach to um, tackling things like security um, and crime and, and prevention because you need to um, recognize that it's an involving uh, market. And as an investor, um, those bits of technology are also important. I think that on uh, the flip side, um, to Chris, Christine's point, um, things like um, ESG are also key overall. And the, there will come a full circle uh, time where you also have to make sure that the myriad of technologies that you have in, in your suite um, are interoperable and working well to solve um, core problems. And those of us that have to, to done these deployments before, I think as an investor, we understand that one solution can't do everything. Um, and you, you do need to make sure that you um, work with others in order to yeah. um, solve the best problem. Great. I've never heard it described as boring fintech, but I'm going to add it as a category to tech you. Well, well, yeah. some people don't think <laughs> it's as hot, uh, yeah. but uh, hot is also, uh, boring is also good. I hot, think. hot is I relative. Know. <laughs> of course. Um, so one thing, one other thing that struck me, just to shift the conversation a bit, um, uh, when we were doing the research for, for the data that we presented, um, a lot of the big investors, uh, at least in the big deals, you know, the Revolut, the Monzos, uh, are coming from the US. And I know that's a topic of conversation uh, within the, the investment community as a whole, but in fintech it's no different. It's KOTU, it's Tiger Global, it's Thrive, um, it's Goldman Sachs, they're all in there, um, you know, financing growth. Uh, of, of uh, our European fintech stars. Is that an issue whatsoever? Is that a problem or is it an opportunity or doesn't it matter whatsoever? Uh, Vinod, maybe you can uh, answer that one first. I think that the, the, the diversity of the capital that is available to all founders and in particular fintech founders is extraordinary in Europe. And the point you make about uh, the crossover funds uh, being present in, in Europe is true. Uh, and part of what they sell is I guess we all sell the ultimate commodity, which is money. And so the only real differentiator is price. And so I think there is an element of trying to understand how value is being sort of almost accreted in a different way, right? In some of the hands of the founder and then some of the hands of the fund. So people like Kotu and Tiger are willing to give up some returns for speed of capital. And so you're thinking about the entire model in a completely different way. But I think I have to say that, you know, we, we're, we're in a moment right now in, you know, we're in Q1, almost at the end of Q1 2022. And there is some anxiety, uh, especially at the later stages. Uh, I think at seed and series A, we're still sort of partying like it's 2020, 2021. Mm -hmm. And I think at series B and C, there's a little bit of like a hesitation around the same multiples being applied. So where do we land? Hard to say, but if you look at the public markets, you know, we're at correction levels beyond 40% um, and you know, some in excess of 50%. So there is an element of understanding how those things weave together because this very same crossover funds like Tiger Co2 started life in, in the public markets as hedge funds. And so if you've now got bargain deals into you know, companies like Robinhood and so on, why would you be worrying about private markets? Because you have liquidity in the public markets. So I think there is an element of how all that weaves itself into what founders want to achieve over the next six, nine months in Europe. Uh, and on the same token, uh, you know, to Adiza's point, uh, you know, borrowing fintech, or we call it the, the infrastructure fintech, the back end of banking, as it were, uh, they remain resilient. They're less susceptible to the ebbs and flows of consumer fintech. And so one of the things that we have seen for sure is um, COVID has accelerated the adoption of difficult to buy technology, like core banking systems, payments, fraud. Uh, and that's partly because they've had time and partly because it was a pressing point of need. During, during lockdown. For example, many banks were uh, offering products that had access to C-bills uh, in the UK. And to access them, you had to speak to someone. It wasn't a click through, why? 
because you didn't have the core infrastructure to unlock it. So I think banks are beginning to think about how do you actually increase access to the products that they have. Uh, and at the same time, people like Revolut and so on, which we happen to be an investor in, are accelerating growth through the consumer lens. No, great. Reginald, I see you nodding very intensively, but do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think in the names that you that you shared, Robin, there are kind of two hats, right? You had the strategic investors where I guess driven by the pandemic that uh, brought the digital deficiencies of established players into focus. Uh, as a result, those players like JP Morgan, Lloyd, Visa have become very acquisitive. Um, thinking about the Visa acquiring Ting, JP Morgan acquiring that medical open invest. Um, so we have seen them move in the later stage um, in later stage scene. And those players understand as well that if they buy at the later stage, the valuation is also higher. So they're moving a bit earlier stage and earlier stage. So we do see them as uh, providing increasing competition on Series A and B. Um, and then when you mentioned the Tiger Globals of this world, well, I think it's also a testimony of the quality of the ecosystem that we have here in Europe. Uh, we see some great, great entrepreneurs and no wonder that you know, they're getting on the radars of, uh, of overseas, uh, overseas investors. So I'm actually very optimistic about 2022. Um, also conscious about the, what, what's happening on a macro level and, and, the, and, the, tent, and the intensity it can bring. Um, and so I, I totally join Benoit on, on, on his point there. Uh, but I think 2022 will be, a, will be a great year again for FinTech. Um, there will be, a, of course, a couple of challenges. Um, companies that have raised at very high valuation last year will be put under a bit of pressure to avoid, avoid down rounds. Um, I think there's an increasingly war of talents. Uh, we see average salaries really through the roof to get strong talents across the board. Um, but in the end, there's still, there's still a lot of dry powder in the market. So um, a lot of funds are, are getting ready to invest more in 2022. I think that's maybe the, the advantage of, of Augmentum and, and Draper is we can be a bit more patient and with less pressure uh, to, to invest when, when the world's a bit crazy uh, with either high valuation or with uh, a tense micro, micro setup. So uh, no, extremely optimistic, but remaining cautious as well. Yeah, just one correction. It's no longer Draper, it's Molten Ventures. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm still not used to it. <laughs> no worries. It's very I'm getting recent. used to it too. It's only, it's only about 13 weeks old. Exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, if, if you're sending me a, a, a sweater with Molten, I'll probably get used to it. <laughs> you heard it here first. Uh, there are witnesses. Um, so, uh, what's happening on the early stage? And, you know, we talk a lot about sort of the saturation of the, the early stage investment environment, especially in the UK. Uh, Suzanne, how do you experience that from, from FinTech Circle's uh, angle? Yeah, I would say in the, on the early stage, you know, startup stage, we see lots of startups being founded across, across all subsectors uh, in, in the FinTech space. We see companies across Europe, you know, across uh, most countries coming forward and also applying to the UK uh, to raise seed capital here. Um, we see also a little bit more women, you know, in in uh, in leadership roles in fintech companies, which is a great thing. I mean, we had International Women's Day yesterday, and we've got this huge imbalance, you know, gender imbalance in terms of both investors and entrepreneurs. Uh, so we see a little bit more, but not enough. Um, and what I think what we, we also see is that lots of um, lots of startups, you know, sometimes try to merge sectors. We see fintech startups who merge into the telecom sector, for example, you know, providing lending solutions for telecoms. So we see interesting combinations which we had not seen before. Uh, and we also see fintech companies already early stage realizing the value of the ecosystem you're building. Uh, and the value uh, of, of really thinking things through at the outset, you know, what your, what your uh, custom acquisition costs are, what is your uh, growth journey. So we, we see lots of, um, I would say, a more sophistication at an earlier stage. And, um, and in terms of valuations, I think it's still high, you know, valuations when we often get them, but people are willing to negotiate because, as we just heard, the later stage investment rounds, especially the public market, is very much under pressure at the moment. So there is a follow on, you know, uh, effect that uh, what, and what you want to avoid is a startup is that you have a high valuation today and then you have a, a down round you know in the future because you upset all your investors who went in too high so that's nobody's uh would be of nobody's benefit so that's i think important for early stage startup founders to understand this well we, we share that information obviously because we want them to be successful long term 
So, but I think overall it's it's still very positive, you know, and and, uh, and I hope that um, Europe, including the UK, you know, continues to grow in in terms of fintech, fintech, uh, fintech power base for the world. Yeah, so very good points there. Thank you for sharing. Um, we have about four minutes left, uh, but I do wanted to follow up on what Reginald was saying uh, by also including some context. Uh, we in the two first months of this year we already tracked about 5.7 billion euros going into European fintech companies, which is far outpacing. Uh, you know, the pace that we had last year for those two months. So if that continues, then we're going to smash all the records once again this year, um, I believe. So things are looking quite positive, at least for the moment. Um, I do want to take the remaining minutes to also talk about the exit environment. You're not in the charity business. You also have to return capital to your investors or public uh, markets. Uh, performance needs to be up to par. Um, we, we tracked about 120 exits last year. Um, a lot of them were undisclosed, so it's very difficult to sort of um, evaluate the, the, the size of the, the exit opportunity here in the, in the fintech space. So I want to get your opinion on this as an investor. Um, do we have a healthy exit environment for fintech companies? Does it need to be healthy? Does it matter to you as an investor at all? Or um, any other thoughts you have on, on sort of this, the exit uh, side of things? Um, Adiza, do you want to take this one first? Um, I think that uh, the exit environment um, with regards to the entrepreneurs that have built and are planning to build again, that is super exciting. Um, we're getting uh, fintech entrepreneurs that are deciding to do it again and wanting to come and do it in Europe. And that I think is a great sign for um, the maturity of the ecosystem. I think that there are a number of uh, stakeholders and players who are public, who are not public about it, but they are looking to um, build their second or third companies. And that talent cycle is really important for Europe. Um, we, we see it in other markets, um, but that talent cycle and that those exits um, are important for the European ecosystem because it allows those that have built before to build again, and also the management teams and the teams that have done it before to come back and, and take those roles. And I think that that is quite important within the exit environment because it's that cycle of capital that we want to keep um, flowing in the European ecosystem. No. Um, as a global uh, company, uh, we see um, what's happening in the US and in Asia. Um, and we also want to make sure that that happens across Europe as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Vinod, as a, a publicly listed investor, what's your take on this? Yeah, so we've, uh, in the last two years, seen uh, an uptick in acquisitive behavior, but interestingly, across the globe rather than focused on Europe. So our European founders are being approached by uh, corporates and big exchanges in Japan, and in Singapore. Uh, we're continuously being approached by big investors and big buyers in the US. So that has always been true, but the last, I think the last 12 to 18 months, the focus has actually been on uh, public markets, either through a traditional IPO or through a SPAC. And what is interesting is that we've seen this huge correction in prices. And so then there's a question as to what is the true fundamental value for a company and where should it travel? Now, the opposite side of that is because of the onslaught of large rounds and to accommodate the large rounds, higher valuations, that increasingly more and more of these companies enter into valuation territory that's no longer in M&A exit territory. And so they then, but they're not designed to IPO yet. So they're all stuck in this phase of like, look, we're building a great company, we're building a big company, we're able to raise the capital, but you don't have the line or the line of sight towards what a public company looks like. So there is this gap of like, do you have enough runway to actually get to the next private round or is it a pre IPO round or is it actually the IPO in itself? And these are companies that are you know, valuations anywhere between 3 billion and, you know, as publicly known, Revolut 33. So it's, it's a question as to how do founders adapt to what public markets might ask of them? And we've been privileged to be in a position to be able to advise them because we did it ourselves. Uh, but I think it remains a challenge to think about what that exit environment at those valuation levels look like. Yeah, to be continued that conversation. Unfortunately, for this one, we're out of time. Uh, I wish we had more time, but unfortunately, we don't. Uh, it was a real pleasure to have you all on the panel. Thank you for sharing your views and insights. I uh, really appreciate it and have a lovely rest of the day. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.